Hello, I'm Harold Jones, Dean of the School of Health Professions at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Thanks for joining us for another discussion in our continuing monthly series where we interview experts in our school. These experts are leaders helping to shape the future of healthcare through tailoring innovative solutions to real world problems. Joining us today is Dr. Janelle Chiasera, Chair of the Department of Clinical and Diagnostic Sciences. As a medical technologist, Janelle joined UAB as the Director of the Clinical Laboratory Science and Medical Technology Programs in 2006 and was promoted to the Chair of the Department in 2012. Prior to UAB, she spent most of her career in Ohio as a faculty member and medical technologist as well as a research assistant at a children's hospital. She is an active member of the American Association of Clinical Chemistry and the American Society for Clinical Laboratory Science. Janelle, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. I want to talk a little bit about the term clinical laboratory scientists. Clinical laboratory scientists play a very valuable role in our healthcare delivery system, yet a lot of people may not know exactly what is uh, covered or is entailed in that particular term and what areas clinical laboratory scientists work. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the role of the clinical laboratory scientists is, is vital for the practice of medicine, and in particular, they're vital for the practice of modern medicine, where there's been this explosion in not only the number of lab tests that we have to offer, but the variety of tests that are offered for physicians out there. And there's a whole other emerging area of clinical laboratory science where we are actually able to now uh, support tests that actually identify risk for the development of chronic conditions like heart disease, diabetes, and certain cancers. So to, to best explain um, what a clinical laboratory scientist is, it, it's, it's best to explain it really by saying if you've ever been to a physician office because you've been sick, um, you have probably indirectly uh, met a clinical laboratory scientist, although you've never met them face to face. Um, if you had a throat swab or a blood sample that was drawn, you indirectly interacted with a clinical laboratory scientist. Those are the professionals that actually take those samples back to the laboratory and perform a full range of laboratory tests on those samples in order to provide feedback back to a physician so that they can make a diagnosis or treat a clinical condition. Uh, clinical laboratory uh, science professionals actually do this in six major areas. So while a lot of people think that a hospital lab is just one small lab room, it actually includes six major areas, uh, chemistry, hematology, immunology, microbiology, transfusion medicine, and molecular diagnostics. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, there are going to be extreme shortages for clinical laboratory scientists over the next decade. What are the factors that are combining to cause these shortages and why should we be concerned about that? There's really an, an interesting situation going on in our profession right now and I like to refer to it as the perfect storm and there are really three things that are contributing to this perfect storm. The first thing is, like you said, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that currently there's a 10% there's a vacancy rate for our professionals out there across the country. On top of that, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has also reported that um, the clinical laboratory science sector is projected to grow by 15% from the year 2010 to the year 2020 requiring approximately 54,000 more professionals in our field. Now the perfect storm comes where we start talking about the education programs that are available to train these professionals. So while there's an increased vacancy rate that's going on and an increased need for our professionals over the next 10 years, the education programs that we have to train clinical laboratory scientists have significantly reduced over the past 20 years. So 20 years ago, we had a little over 400 academic programs that existed across the country. 10 years ago, that was reduced to somewhere around 245 programs and we currently uh, have about 224 programs across the country to train clinical laboratory scientists. Those 224 programs uh, provide a pipeline of about 3,300 professionals that are board certified a year and that's about average for us. So if you do the math, graduating and board certifying about 3,300 students a year for those 224 programs isn't even going to touch the need that we have out there for professionals. So that's why I believe we're in this perfect storm. There's an increased need for our professionals and we aren't graduating enough professionals that we have out there. Now while I believe that that's a perfect storm for our profession, it's great news for students who are looking for a degree where upon graduation if you successfully complete your board certifying exam, you're almost guaranteed a job. 
Janelle, you mentioned that one of the factors that you believe is leading to this shortage uh, is the number of training programs, that in effect there are actually fewer training programs. Yet this decrease or this decline in number of training programs is occurring at a time when there is this increased demand uh, in the healthcare workforce for these graduates. What are some reasons for why we would be seeing these program closures? Well, I, I believe that there are a few things that are feeding into this. And, and the first thing, I, I think that there is a, a profound lack of understanding of the value and the importance of our professionals in the healthcare industry. The second thing is these are incredibly intensive programs with extensive hands-on experience associated with the curricula. And so these tend to be very expensive programs. And in fact, uh, more often than not, they are the most expensive programs that exist at universities. And the third thing that I think contributes to this is um, uh, the enrollments in these programs are typically low. And a lot of times we like that because we like to have a low student to teacher ratio because we have to assure that our that our students are proficient at what they do when they graduate and that's because a lot of other healthcare providers rely on the information that we provide to make medical decisions so I think it's a combination of a lack of understanding of the importance of these programs and the high cost and low enrollments that put these programs at uh, for uh, susceptibility for closure uh, especially in these times of um, these challenging economic times. When I talk to other deans across the country, many of whom are actually closing programs at their institutions, one of the factors that they mention is that in their individual programs they're actually seeing uh, a decrease or low student uh, engagement or uh, application rates for these particular programs. Why do you think with a job market that is so open and abundant and job opportunities abounding that we would have problems attracting students into these particular programs. I think uh, there's, a, again, a, a few reasons for this. The first one is I don't think that we do as a profession and as educators a good enough job recruiting early and often to students, um, uh, starting in high schools and also in freshman year trying to, to help students or recruit them into our programs. The second thing is I think there's just this, again, a lack of understanding of who we are. And I think that has to do with the fact that we're behind the scenes types of professionals. And so when you go to the hospital because you're sick or you go to a physician's office, the person that you usually interact with is a physician, a nurse, a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant, and occasionally you might interact with a respiratory therapist. Rarely will you ever see a clinical laboratory scientist. So people just don't know who we are. And then the third reason is I, I don't believe that students understand really the job opportunities that we have out there. I believe that students think that with a, a general BS degree that they're able to get jobs in hospital laboratories. And, and the fact of the matter is they're, they're not able to get those jobs unless they uh, graduate from an accredited program and are board certified. So I think it's a combination of those three things. As we're watching healthcare evolve in this country, what are some ways that clinical laboratory scientist training and education and roles may change in order to uh, adjust to these changes in the healthcare system and to add additional value and frankly make the career even more attractive for potential students? Well, I think as a profession we need to do a much better job of advocating for our professionals to be taking on more of uh, an expanded role in clinical medicine from the standpoint of uh, expanding into roles of consultation where we help physicians with appropriate test utilization and appropriate test interpretation. So from the professional field, we need to expand that way. From the healthcare industry perspective, they need to start using us for the information that we have. So they need to start putting us on medical diagnostic teams or other medical teams and including us in grand rounds just like they include pharmacists. pharmacists recently have been included in grand rounds to help physicians understand drug effects and drug interactions, I believe wholeheartedly that clinical laboratory scientists are equally as important to have on that team so that physicians understand what tests to order, when they should order it, and um, the interpretation of that, of that value in light of uh, their, the clinical presentation of that patient. In the, in the not so distant past, um, 
this was never really an issue. It, things were less complicated. And that's when there were probably 30 or so laboratory tests that existed. And physicians were quite capable and did a really good job of selecting the appropriate test to use to diagnose the common conditions that are coming into either the hospital or their, their physician offices. That's not the case anymore today, especially in the last decade where there's been this explosion of laboratory tests. There are now thousands of tests that are offered for physicians. And there are a couple things that we know. When there are more tests to offer, there are more choices that physicians can make. When they have more choices to make, they're, they are more likely to make a wrong choice. And they don't make a wrong choice because they don't know what they're doing. They make a wrong choice because we've created this increasingly complex system that is almost impossible for them to navigate. And I want to provide one example for you uh, on this. In 2012, we did twice as many uh, tests to assess vitamin D deficiency in patients than we did in 2011. And that was due in part to uh, a growing concern not only by physicians and, uh, but also patients in uh, vitamin D status because a vitamin D deficiency state can lead to chronic conditions like diabetes mellitus, osteoporosis, and certain cancers. So physicians in 2012 really wanted to do a lot of vitamin D testing. Well, it would seem logical that when a physician comes in and says, I'd like to assess a vitamin D status in my patient, that they would go into a computer screen and select the vitamin D test. Well, it's become so complex that when a physician goes onto the computer screen, there are 18 vitamin D tests that exist. And there's really only one of those vitamin D tests that actually should be used to assess vitamin D deficiency. And it's not even called vitamin D. It's called 25-hydroxy vitamin D. So we've created this very complex system that's hard for physicians to navigate, and it's very confusing for them. And really, it can lead to adverse patient outcomes. So I think really the truly greatest contribution that we can make make is to help physicians uh, select appropriate tests, when to actually perform those tests, and to help the physicians actually interpret that test result. The School of Health Professions is helping in revamping the Master of Science and Clinical Laboratory Science curriculum, and we're revamping that to include instruction or education on training students to be equipped to take on these advanced roles. So to be able to serve on medical diagnostics teams, to be able to serve on grand rounds. And we're actually partnering with local hospitals and UAB to actually provide graduate projects that actually focus on appropriate test utilization. While these changes in roles that you're talking about for the clinical laboratory scientists that include them more as part of the team delivering care, while those are very attractive and while I think those indeed will attract more students into clinical laboratory scientists and make the career even more engaging than it currently is, those are long-term changes. Those are things that require that the system respond over time, yet we're faced with these really acute needs for uh, workforce in the clinical laboratory sciences area. What are some things that the school or the industry or the government might be doing in order to promote at least getting more individuals into clinical laboratory scientists in the short term? From a school and a program perspective, we are trying to uh, increase the marketing that we have associated with the program so that we can increase our visibility, get the word out about who we are early to students so they can select us as a first choice. Often we have students come in that already have a bachelor's degree. They come through our master's degree and often tell us that, boy, had we only known that this existed, we would have come into your program. So we're trying to reach out to students a little bit more uh, often and a little bit earlier for those students. Um, the healthcare industry is, is supporting this by providing scholarships um, to offset the cost of tuition or to provide students with some spending money while they're going through these programs and as an incentive to get students into these programs. In addition, there are some grants that are available out there that are helping us as programs to attract students to our uh, programs by providing tuition assistant, assistance. Our uh, program was fortunate enough to be awarded a HRSA grant uh, last year um, uh, to the tune of $620,000 where we can use that money to attract students into this uh, field and offset their tuition costs. So we hope that all of those things put together will help um, battle against the, the challenge that we have of finding students for this profession. Janelle, thank you for once again sharing your expertise and your experiences with us about clinical laboratory scientists and helping us to understand a little bit better how clinical laboratory scientists fit into the healthcare delivery system. Well, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. 
To learn more about our clinical laboratory science program, please visit their website at www.uab.edu slash mscls. If you have any questions or comments about this topic, please feel free to contact us at uab.edu slash shp slash contact. And while you're on our website, be sure to learn more about our school. Once again, thank you for joining us. I'm Harold Jones, Dean of the UAB School of Health Professions, where we're shaping the future of healthcare through tailoring innovative solutions to real-world problems.